Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Jenny Wenger. I'm Director of Programs here at Linux Foundation Public Health and really excited to welcome you all today uh, to our, our webinar. So we are very lucky to have Dr. Mark Breyers here with us. He is a uh, professor at the Alan Turing Institute and has been one of the key uh, participants, one of the, one of the key leads on the NHS's uh, COVID-19 exposure notification app. Uh, also one of the one of the lead authors on the recent research that came out from the NHS about the efficacy of the UK's uh, contact tracing app, exposure notification app. And so we are really excited to have him here today to talk more about that research, uh, about some of the risk scoring that went into it um, and how they got to the results they did. Uh, just as a reminder, this uh, event is uh, managed by the uh, LFPH Code of Conduct. I will share a link to that in the chat. Um, and also, if you do have any questions during the during his presentation, please do use the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screen in order to ask your questions. And then um, it, we will we will answer the, we will answer them at the end and have time for questions. We, we will have plenty of time for questions. Uh, as well, if you want to get more involved in LFPH, uh, please do sign up for our newsletter, which uh, I'll also drop a link for that in the Slack or in the chat. And then you can also join our Slack channel where we have ongoing conversation about exposure notification, vaccine credentials, and other technology related to public health. Um, so with that, I am really pleased to welcome Mark and uh, pass it off to him. Thank you very much, Jenny, and thank you for the opportunity to present to you all today. Now, let me share my screen. So uh, please shout out, Jenny, if you can't see my screen. You're looking good. Super. OK. So um, yeah, it's my pleasure to present to you a quick overview of um, the NHS COVID-19 app, uh, which covers England and Wales. So it's not the whole of the UK, um, just England and Wales and Scotland and our friends in Northern Ireland um, have their own apps. Um, and I'm sure they'd be plenty happy to talk to you about those. And I just noticed um, Gar's comments. So happy St. Patrick's Day to um, those of you that celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll jump straight into the presentation. So what do I want to cover today? I want to give you a quick overview of the NHS app, and then I'm going to dig into some of the technical details. Um, but I'll be brief, but um, I'll try to kind of go deep quite quickly. So apologies if some of the detail um, feels unnecessary, but uh, for those of you that are interested, at least it will be done. I'll talk for one slide about the impact results that we have, and then briefly touch upon uh, future potential directions, things that we're busying ourselves with at the moment. So in terms of background, just one slide. Um, the app is kind of um, similar to lots of other apps around the world. Um, it has the standard um, trace functionality, um, which I'm going to dig into in a more detail shortly. Um, we have an ability to alert users. So users specify the postal district, um, which I'm not sure how well that phrase translates across uh, the world, but the first part of the zip code, essentially, um, which allows us to um, narrow down the user's kind of voluntarily specified location to one of about 10,000 um, households. So it gives us a, a rough um, location for the user, but of course they can, the user can specify any postal district in the country. Um, and so that needn't necessarily be precise. And we don't validate that in any way uh, for privacy reasons. And um, perhaps one of the more kind of unique features of the NHS app is the check-in feature. So I know our friends in New Zealand have a similar feature on their app too, um, but um, we, we rolled out um, the check-in feature alongside contact tracing back in September. And so users can go to a venue, uh, scan a QR code, and um, uh, in a decentralized privacy preserving manner, I'm not going to cover that in much detail today, but that allows the users to um, keep a digital record of the venues that they visited. And if there is an outbreak at that venue, then we can send alerts to those specific users. 
um, using a kind of QR, um, QR set intersection trick in the same way that the key intersection trick works for contact tracing. And that actually, um, from the user research that we've done through surveys, et cetera, um, that does appear to be quite a popular feature and one of the major reasons why we in the UK, oh, sorry, in England and Wales had um, had such a high, relatively high um, uptake of the app. The users can specify symptoms, uh, they can book a test, you know, receive the test results back via the app. Um, and it has quite a nice feature, which is the isolation countdown. Um, and because there's a kind of complex set of rules depending upon, um, well, it feels like depending upon the day of the week, it's not quite so bad, um, depending on whether you, what kind of test you got, where you're taking it, what policy we're in, so on and so forth. Um, it's quite complex for general users to understand how long they should be isolating for. Um, and so the app automatically computes that and gives them a countdown. And um, so the, they're the core features of the app. So let me dig into the uh, app usage. So this is um, England and Wales, the kind of the greater the purple color, the um, higher the app uptake based on the user's um, specified location. And then we have some um, discontinuities in, in, in certain regions in the kind of more orangey colors on this diagram. And that's important that, well, firstly, we want everything to be purple and that'd be the ideal situation, but actually we can exploit that um, heterogeneity of um, uptake across uh, England and Wales in order to produce some of the results that we produced uh, for the impact um, results that we, uh, we've created. But I'll come on to that a bit later on. So we have this kind of heterogeneous mix of, of users across the country. But when you look at the two countries, but when you look at the overall um, user numbers, we've got 48 million eligible adults in England and Wales, of whom 71% have um, compatible smartphones. And of these, in fact, the number's slightly higher than, well, it's, it's, it's over 21 million have installed the app. Um, I, I should be able to revise that figure because um, it, you know, it keeps ticking over, thankfully, keeps increasing, um, but I'm not, I've not got the permission to say what the new number is, but I'm sure you can use your imagination and uh, figure out what might be the next number that would appear on this slide if I put 21 million there. Um, and then we have an active um, user threshold of 16.5 uh, million. So this is a lower bound, and I'll come on to explain why it's a lower bound in a moment. Um, but what we've got here is um, a couple of figures that um, I briefly wanted to talk through. Because yeah, the, again, these are important to understand how our users are using the app and, and, and some of the kind of details that sit behind the app. Uh, so first of all, we have this um, nice smooth download trajectory we launched at the end of September, and, and we've had a kind of you know, a, a very sudden and quick rise. In fact, um, to my daughter's um, this, this pleasure, um, the NHS app was the number two downloaded app just behind Zoom um, in um, England and Wales. Um, in 2020, with TikTok being number three, that's why she was unhappy. Um, and so, um, so, so we had massive uptake at the beginning, and then it's kind of uh, tailed off. But nevertheless, it's still mono, it's still increasing. And these are app, these are unique app users. The usage figure is is somewhat variable. Um, and, and usage, the reason, the way in which we can compute usage is every day, uh, the app, um, each app, um, each install. Um, essentially sends a heartbeat message back to um, the central server. Now we can't try, we can't um, kind of correlate these over time, um, but we do get about thir 30 dimensions, essentially 30 data points returned from each app user um, or each installed app every day. Um, and um, the volatility in this usage number is largely driven by some challenges that we've had with um, the Android operating system and the um, stability of that data being sent back, um, in particular, um, this heartbeat data that I refer to. And so what we were able to do is correlate numerous data sources that we have access to in order to produce this lower bound of 16.5 million active users um, from the overall 21 or so million people that have installed the app. But we know that this is a lower bound. And in the impact results that we um, produced, and we thought it was appropriate to be conservative in our estimate of active users um, so that we could um, not, over, not artificially overinflate the results that we produce. Um, but we are working um, quite hard to resolve this um, data issue 
um, on the Android platform, and I hope and expect that to that to be resolved in the very near future. But that's one of the things that keeps me awake at night. Um, from from the second diagram here, what we have is um, we we have the number of positive tests um, that are recorded in the app on a daily basis or via the app on a daily basis um, up until more or less the kind of middle of January on this diagram. Um, and then what we have um, in the orange um, kind of um, uh, line here is the number of positive tests after the users have received a positive exposure notification. So these are the people that we've asked to isolate and then they've gone on to test positive. So it's these people that we um, that, that we're really proud of the, these these users because obviously the app has has done something positive there is assume that the users have taken the advice on board then they've isolated themselves from their friends family and community and that's helped to stop the transmission of the virus and again I'll, I'll dig into that in a little bit more detail a bit later on um and, and and that's not to say again this this number is a lower bound on the actual um um positive test after exposure notification because in England and I believe Wales and what we have is a or what we had up until this point what we now have is different but what we had up until the point at which this data ends is a test on symptoms um, based approach and so the symptoms the users that have been asked to, asked to isolate who would have isolated but didn't develop symptoms wouldn't have necessarily taken a test because there would be no need to and that wasn't the policy at the time and therefore this number um, just encompasses um, the users that were asked to take a test and therefore is a lower bound on the number. Then what we got on the right hand side here is um, a time series plot of the number of notifications that were sent um, to the users as a um, uh, yeah as a, as, a, as a function. So these are notifications um, to isolate and um, what you can see is that it kind of follows the um, England and Wales kind of pandemic trajectory um, in the sense of we had a kind of second wave around November time and then we had a horrendous wave um, kind of over Christmas and into the new year and thankfully we're kind of down here again now um, in terms of well, in terms of all the indicators we've come right back down so um, that's 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 quite a good situation for us to be in but um, the, the fact that the notifications um, followed that trajectory gives us some warmth that the app is doing what we expect now this strange inflection point here is, is as a result of us uh, migrating to um, version two of exposure notification. And, and we made a couple of changes, algorithmic and, and statistical changes at this point, which um, significantly improved the impact of the app um, from the point at which we introduced um, version two of the exposure notification API. So um, I, I'll tell you what we did in a moment, um, but you can see that drove more um, or notifications to isolate, which drives greater impact uh, in the app system. So let me let me dig into some of the techie stuff, and I'll try to be brief on this. Um, so we've got, um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, probably better than I, and um, we have five factors available to characterize transmission, um, COVID-19 transmission in particular. So there is a weighting associated with a potentially affected user. Um, so that is, are they vaccinated or not? Um, or one of an example is whether they're vaccinated or not. Um, and, and, and so if they're vaccinated, for instance, you may wish to compensate for the fact that they're vaccinated from the computation of the risk calculation um, and kind of um, downweight the, the risk that that individual has actually contracted COVID as a result of an exposure. Um, at the moment, that isn't built in, that, that, that um, calculation is implicitly um, a, a kind of identity calculation is, is set to the number one. Um, but we are working through a bunch of kind of um, statistical analysis in order to see what that number should be, um, because you know the UK um, is at um, around I think it's 22 million um, adults now vaccinated, so a large proportion of our user base is already vaccinated. So this is quite a high priority for us, for us to retain um, user buy-in for the app. Then there's a, a factor associated with context of context adjusting. So um, whether an individual is indoor or outdoor, so basically a function of the ventilation of the environment that the encounter takes place. Um, and um, what the actual variant of um, COVID is, so the, the term used in the UK is variants of concern. 
Um, and you know, B117, for instance, the so-called um, UK variant, um, or Kent variant, if you're in the UK, we blame people from Kent, um, the rest of the world blames the UK um, for that particular evolution of the virus. And, um, and, and that's meant to, that's, that's considered to be more transmissible than um, the kind of classic COVID. Um, and so you, one may win, wish to take into account um, additional context um, when computing transmission risk and, and, and the um, transmission overall from an encounter. And then we've got three factors in the risk calculation associated with the things that we all probably know and love. The first one is the infectiousness of the index case at the time of the encounter. Um, a distance related factor, which is, is, is spoken about probably a little bit too much in my opinion, um, but nevertheless, it's the one that we all um, focus on, this two meters um, rule. And then a duration related factor of, um, well, in, in the UK, at least it's 15 minutes, two meters. And then a, a risk, the risk score is a combination of all of these factors. It's a um, heuristic as it stands. So it's not, um, it, it's, it's motivated by one's understanding of the scientific understanding of how the virus transmits um, as specified here, it's available in more detail in this paper that I pushed out onto the internet back in May, which feels like a long time ago now. And um, we do have a full probabilistic model, um, but that's not yet in use, um, albeit I'm pushing hard for that to be used. And the reason I think that's important is because if you can quantify everything statistically, then we can actually stay ahead of the virus, in my opinion, because fundamentally um, we're playing a probabilistic game um, with respect to public health measures and non pharmaceutical one pharmaceutical interventions of this kind in order to um, ascertain whether an individual should isolate or not. Um, so we have a full probabilistic representation, but at the moment we're using heuristic that is um, represented in this paper. Um, I'm going to um, very briefly um, touch upon this, but there's a second paper that I'll draw your attention to for those of you interested in the real detail. And really what we've done is to um, produce the statistical characterization of how um, RSSI data um, um, behaves as a function of all of the different latent variables um, and including distance. So how does RSSI change as a function of um, distance? Has it changed as a function of different forms of obfuscation, such as the phone being in a pocket or in a bag or whatever? How does it change as a function of orientation? Has it changed as a result of multipath? Um, and so on and so forth. So we've um, captured all those sources of uncertainty and um, produced a statistical representation of um, the data generating process that underpins the um, the app's usage in, in real world. And, and that's been quite useful for us to be able to then um, undertake a hell of a lot of modeling, statistical and mathematical modeling um, of the different um, ways in which one can configure the app and come up with the optimal configuration of the app to give the greatest health benefit. So whilst if you dig, do dig into the detail, it looks like it's been done for the purposes of kind of um, ap academic kind of um, interest. And that's not true at all. The reason that we did all of this work was largely to ensure that um, the citizens of England and Wales had the best performing app possible. And we could prove that mathematically and statistically. Um, so we, we did a bunch of work documented in this um, uh, paper. Um, and we also introduced a statistical approach to estimating risk, which the details are not that important for the purposes of this talk, but it's, it's known as an unscented column and smoothing algorithm. What it allows us to do is to quantify the risk over distance conditioned on um, attenuation data or RSS, implicitly on RSSI data. Um, and that allows us to produce a probability distribution over distance um, given those RSSI sequence data. And crucially, the kind of intuition behind this algorithm and what we exploit in version two of the API is we can we can basically um, tie together measurements as a function of um, of time. So um, there, are, if you think about how um, the API works, there are essentially two modes. There's exposure window mode, which is what we use, and there's the what I like to think of as the histogram mode. Um, where health authorities are able to choose the kind of wide configuration or the narrow configuration or their own configuration. You specify bin sizes and then all of the different attenuation data kind of gets pushed into one bin or another. And then you say one takes a weighted combination of those different bins in order to infer um, distance duration combinations. We took a slightly different approach based on this kind of statistically motivated point, which is 
that with the exposure window data that we have access to through version two of the API, uh, we can exploit the fact that an interaction between me and another user, for instance, the volatility in that interaction in the real world is not going to is not going to be particularly large. I.e., if I'm chatting to somebody or I'm, I'm walking beside them or I'm standing beside them in a supermarket queue, um, I'm not going to be ten meters um, at one moment and then half a meter in the next moment and then twenty meters another moment and so on and so forth. Which is if 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 one views the raw RSSI data um, kind of naively, then that's what the um, raw ISSI data would lead you to believe. So you can exploit the fact that human interactions have this spatial temporal smoothness in the trajectories. Embody that, that, that spatial temporal smoothness in some form of statistical representation. Again, the details I'll skirt over. And that drives an extra level of accuracy in, um, in one's ability to infer distance. Um, and that's what we've exploited in our implementation. Um, and so um, we did a bunch of kind of modeling work. Um, but that's all great, but we also wanted to test it in the real world. So we, we, we ran a bunch of scenarios and the data is available on our GitHub website, NHSX GitHub repo, and I can send you the link or I can send it via Jenny, I'll put it on the Slack if you're interested. Um, but we, we modeled a bunch of scenarios, outdoor barbecue pub, um, uh, being on a London bus um, in an office and we simulated a conference. Uh, we had up to 20 people, different device states, different devices, different operating systems. And we asked the users to behave like they would um, if they were in those environments more naturally. Now, that's quite difficult to ascertain, of course, and user behavior is, um, is, is, is quite difficult to um, replicate in general. Um, but um, what we have um, is... Um, these conclusions. Um, mode two, I'm in particular exposure window um, implementation using the uncensored con smoothing based algorithm that we um, that was available in that paper, um, and also the implementation, our source code implementation is available on our GitHub website, um, gives much better performance in terms of its ability to characterize um, and discriminate between high and medium risk encounters. So a high risk encounter being within two meters, 15 minutes, and a medium risk encounter being outside of that two meters, 15 minutes. And the reason that I call it medium risk is that it's still an encounter with an index case. And therefore there's still a non-zero probability that um, uh, you know, COVID was transmitted um, with respect to that encounter, um, but it wasn't necessarily falling within the um, government policy of two meters, 15 minutes. And um, so it's not zero risk, but it's therefore a medium risk. So we're discriminating um, with um, probability of about 0.84, which is what this, um, early under the curve is representing. And that's that's considered by the machine learning community in general to be excellent performance. So we're, we're quite pleased with the performance of the app from its ability to differentiate. Uh, the modeling and simulation work was also consistent with the field tests, which validated our earlier recommendations to government ministers. Um, and then in general, we found that um, distance duration characterization is generally better um, uh, outdoors than indoors, and that's largely because um, there's there's fewer sources of multipath in an outdoor environment, and therefore performance tends to be better. So that's what we believe ha is happening in that particular case. Um, so that that's kind of how we optimize the app. Um, but because we get all of this data coming back, I just wanted to spend a couple of moments talking through the exposure notifications per index case because this is driving fascinating insight at the um, uh, kind of public health local public health authority level now and really allowing us to um, help shape the local public um, kind of policy interventions uh, because the UK or other England, um, I should say, is a patchwork of different um, kind of um, rules across the country and even more so at the kind of local level. Um, and so we're advising different local health authorities and the exposure notifications per index case is literally what it says what it tries to indicate it's how many exposure notifications is the app sending per index case and and that gives us a measure of kind of the um the the amount of risky population mixing in the environment um so i'll give you an example if we've got a local authority let's call it local authority a um it's got a seven it's got a hypothetical seven day in seven day case rate of 100 cases per 100,000 of the population and we've got local authority B, 
Um, we've got the same um, seven day case um, rate of 100 um, um, cases per 100,000 of the population. So we've normalized the units. Oops. So we've got, um, we've got those two figures, but when we compute the average um, risky encounters per index case, which is normalized by up uptake in those regions, then we're able to um, um, compute that in local authority A, that we've got three risky encounters per index case, whereas in local authority B, we have an average of eight risky encounters per index case. And what that's telling us, um, uh, the kind of, um, you know, the question is which locality would you expect to experience the largest or fastest increase in cases and, and which should we be most worried about? Well, of course, it's the one on the right, because if on average we've got eight interactions between potentially affected users and an index case in this region, uh, whereas we only have three in this, well, of course, we need to worry about this, but we need to worry more about this region. And so whilst the decentralized nature of the app doesn't give us direct access to the contact graph, it does allow us to infer this particularly interesting statistic or indicator, which allows us to um, understand um, what's going on within the population and make those interventions. And we, we're doing some statistical analysis at the moment um, to prove that actually what this has given local health authority is a, a near real time, so it's a 24 hour delay in insight into what's going on in the local health region. Typically the kind of indicators that they're get, getting are one or two weeks lagged behind the current situation. Uh, with the NPICs and the app, this has given a 24, approximately 24 hour delay. So this is kind of near real time insights um, into what's going on in the population, which is really proven invaluable. Uh, the other thing that we, the other unique part of the app, so there's lots of really fascinating insights we're getting from the data, but the other one is um, venue check-in differencing. So at the moment, the um, well, England and Wales are in different stages of kind of rolling back on the national level lockdowns, but let's just say, for example, we're all in, um, some form of national lockdown, we've got stay at home orders and we're not really allowed to leave our home other than for specific reasons. And that's been the case for a few months now. Um, but prior to, uh, prior to that, uh, when the app was um, uh, being used um, kind of prior to Christmas and, and we were allowed to do different things, we had across England and Wales, we had different um, types of policy intervention. Pubs were open in some areas, pubs were closed in others. You're allowed to go to the hairdressers in some areas, you weren't in others, and so on and so forth. And, and what that what we can use is the venue check-in data, and, and, diff, and in particular, the difference between successive weeks of venue check-in data in order to um, see whether the population is adhering to the various um, uh, kind of measures that are put into place. And what this beautiful, I, I, I've, I've looked at, I almost look at this graph every every. Um, day since I produced it just before Christmas um, because I find it fascinating and what it's telling me is that the different policy interventions that are in play across the country really come through the app and users are really adopting the QR check-in um, capability of the app um, and, and the regions that are in black um, so this region and, and the Isle of Wight just down here which is slightly less black but still kind of darker than some of the other regions these were the these were the most kind of open regions at this particular point in time the purple regions were um, slightly less open, but still quite open. And then the orange regions um, were kind of more or less in a lock, complete lockdown. So users aren't going to the venues that they, in these regions, users aren't going to the venues that they um, shouldn't be going to, which is good. Um, and, 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 um, and, and, you know, users are in these venues. So it kind of given us an insight into what's happening across the country and, and kind of adherence to general public policy um, interventions more generally, again, with a 24 hour lag. Now, um, that's all well and good. And I've kind of skirted over about six months of my um, life as well as what I should have said, obviously it's not just my life, there's a um, hundred or so other people working on the NHS app um, and many colleagues before them um, from other organizations and companies and so on that we've been building on their work. So many, many person hours worth of effort gone into a lot of work that I've summarized very short period of time and um, certainly I shouldn't take the credit for um, much of it um, but one of the questions we asked of ourselves as as an app is has it delivered impact and so we wanted to perform a statistical analysis of data that were available to us in real in order to really understand um, whether all of the assertions that we've been making all of the investment that we've been making to date um, as, a, as a kind of um, as citizens if you like um, 
both as app users, but also as taxpayers, has actually been worth it? And the short answer is yes, the app is worth it. It is delivering impacts. And we have um, what we believe to be strong statistical evidence to, um, uh, to, to demonstrate that. So um, I'll, so there's a paper that's available and that I think Jenny has linked on the um, LFPH um, Slack channel and that I would encourage you to read if you're interested in the results and how we went about this. Um, and really what we did was to, we, we took two approaches. I'm just gonna very quickly talk through the statistical approach. Um, and um, what we did was to um, exploit the heterogeneity of the uptake in the app um, across the different regions. So with greater app uptake, um, we were able to see how the caseload varied, which is what um, this um, set of diagrams here. This is all the different regions in the country, countries, um, and and the kind of um, pandemic trajectories of those countries. And we were able to um, basically perform a comparison as if we were emulate. We were effectively trying to emulate as if we were running a randomized control experiment, randomized control trial. But we obviously weren't because that would be unethical. But we're exploiting the fact that there was this uptake heterogeneity across the country, um, and 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 one could argue well, actually there's probably quite a lot of different confounders associated with um, with the impact of the app um, across the country. So deprivation, um, age, the the kind of general health of the population in different regions, um, the, um, the the kind of citizens, um, uh, what's the word, um, adherence to instructions. Um, and so on and so forth. So many confounders associated with, um, you know, COVID-19 and the pandemic that um, different regions, different countries experience. And so uptake in itself is an uptake in the kind of results and um, pandemic trajectory isn't sufficient. And so again, I didn't, I won't go through the detail of what we did exactly, um, but what we did was to use a match differences based approach, which is um, an approach that's borrowed from the economics literature, the economic academic literature um, in order to assess the impact of the app and to, to cut the long story short um, in 2020 um, the median um, uh, figure that we have estimated using this statistical analysis is that 600,000 cases of COVID were presented in 2020 um, and the other conclusion that we were able to reach is that for every one percent increase in app users cases decreased by 2.3 percent um, and we were able to translate that, albeit with greater uncertainty, into a number of uh, deaths averted, um, and we're able to look at different um, other, pot other potential interventions that we could make around the app and, and, and play around with the data in order to further, further potentially increase its impact in the future. So we're super proud with both the analysis that we did, but the impact that the app has had as a non-pharmaceutical intervention across England and Wales, and it really does justify all of the great work by um, my team, but also all of the great work by colleagues around the world, including many on this call at the moment and, and, and friends and colleagues from Google and Apple. So I, I, I genuinely kind of thank everybody for their involvement. Um, and and I'm, uh, you know, I can't statistically guarantee that the app is having such an impact across the rest of the world, but I'm pretty sure that these results would loosely translate across the rest of the world. Um, and, and so we're pleased about that. Um, I, I noticed Jenny's turned the camera on and I know she's um, conscious that I have to pick my daughter up from school shortly. So um, I, I'll be very quick and just kind of touch upon uh, where we're going at the moment and then try to answer some of your questions. Um, so um, we're doing a lot of different work around um, different variants. Um, we're looking historically to see whether we could have used app data to um, um, spatial tem use spatial temporal modeling techniques to see whether we could have spotted B117 had we been looking for it prior to it becoming kind of, um, you know, widely known in its existence, um, including um, incorporating wastewater data and so on. Um, we are doing work on privacy preserving mechanisms for indoor outdoor determination. I've mentioned the full probabilistic representation of the risk score. Um, uh, perhaps the most interesting one as well this and then I'll stop is the probabilistic model for the reproduction number from the exposure notification per index case. So the NPIC figure is um, is useful but it's not that it, people don't really understand it or rather it takes me a while to explain it to public health officials whereas people believe that they understand the reproduction number although I suspect most people don't. Um, and so what we're doing is um, producing a full probabilistic representation of the reproduction number 
uh, from this so that we can give a real time estimate of, of RT um, given, you know, given our data. And, and I think this is super cool and really going to help to shape the public policy interventions um, at the regional level in the UK. So I will stop there and stop my share and um, try to answer as many questions as I can in the few minutes that I've got before I have to run and pick my daughter up. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Yeah, so um, Mark, first I would like to invite, you know, perhaps one of the things we can do is we can continue the questions uh, asynchronously on the Slack channel uh, within the exposure yep. notification yep. channel. And that would be a good way to get to a few more of them than we're gonna have time for here. Um, so I think, you know, so the top question uh, is, did you use any nudging techniques to motivate users to actually you know, install or use the app or be active with it? Um, so the, I, I would argue that the QR check-in feature is probably the best nudging feature that we've got um, because the, the rule in um, England at least is that if you go into a venue, you're legally obliged um, to either write your name down on a piece of paper, and that's clearly not that privacy preserving, um, because you don't know who else can read that piece of paper and what the kind of you know the venue does with that information. Well, I'm sure all of the venues in England are all legit and above board. Um, or you can scan the QR code, and that information stays on your device, never leaves your device. Um, and we, we as um, the public health authority, never get to learn of that information. And that feature proved to be particularly popular with our user base. So I think that's the that's the nudge that helped our user base kind of engage with the app and also. Um, you know, use exposure notification more generally. Oh, and, and I feel like that's actually a really nice way to have people see it's it's advertisement for the app every single place that you go outside of your home. So that's another way in which it probably yeah. helped get the adoption numbers in the UK up to where they are. It's uh, a really good point. We had essentially um, eight, uh, sorry, eight million posters. No matter where you go in the in England, at least you see one of our posters, a QR, big QR code with a big kind of splash point with the link to the URL to download the app and so on. So we had 8 million businesses print advertisement posters for us as well, which was really helpful. It was a super <laughs> idea. Yes. Um, so, and uh, Jeff Engel uh, asked, uh, you know, you mentioned the uh, infectiousness of the index case at time of encounter as one of the, is one of the uh, transmission characteristic factors. Um, how are you determining that? Is it with symptoms or you mentioned a little bit based on variant? Um... Uh, so there's a, there's a paper, there's a few scientific publications that document um, how one characterizes the infections of the index case, but it's a function of the um, time of the onset of the symptoms. And if we don't know the time of the onset of the symptoms, then we take the um, actual um, test date of the, um, of the, of the, of the positive app user of the index case. And, and it's actually, um, it, it, the distribution of the infectiousness is a viable distribution. There's a couple of publications that have uh, commented on this. Um, and, um, and yeah, we approximate that using, um, well, um, using the approximation that the gain API forces us to use um, through this kind of low, medium, high quantification. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think Google and Apple are familiar with my views on how how coarse that approximation is and how it would be much better for us all if it were less coarse. But, oh. um, but I can point you with the paper if you That'd be great. Yeah, perhaps that can be uh, shared in the, in the Slack as well. Uh, and yeah. and uh, so, so final question, because uh, I know that you do have to run. Uh, is there were actually several people who asked uh, if there are stats on the false positive and false negative notification rates. How often do uh, you know yes. whether somebody got, got one of the notifications uh, incorrectly? Um, well, we'll never know whether anybody got a notification incorrectly, because what does that mean? Um, but in terms of the um, two meters, 15 minutes, uh, we've done quite a lot of experimentation and modeling and simulation. In fact, I quickly skimmed over the rock curves that allows one to produce the false positive, false negative rates. So that the ability to um, differentiate between high and medium risk encounters, we get an AUC of 0.84. The specific um, uh, false positive, false negative rates depends on the threshold that's chosen. Uh, so where you sit on that rock curve. Um, the, um, I, I've not got the numbers off the top of my head, but I, um, I recall it, it's on a blog post that I wrote on my website. Um, but essentially, I recall um, our secretary's 
without choosing a threshold that resulted in a false, uh, resulted in a true positive rate of 0.7 and a false positive rate. And um, where false positive means that the user may have been one or two centimeters kind of greater than two meters. So it doesn't mean that they're being erroneously notified, uh, which is why I talk about medium risk encounter, but that false positive rate, is, if I remember correctly, was less than 15%. Um, but please do have a look on my website on, on, um, on my blog post and you'll have the exact number because I apologize. I've, not spoken to that for such a about that for such a long time that I've forgotten the exact number. No worries. But, but we're, we're really pleased with the performance. It could always be improved, uh, but we're really pleased with the performance we're getting. Wonderful. Well, I hope that that there there is a sea of people at home um, providing applause and thank yous to you uh, for <laughs> for this presentation. It was really excellent, uh, and we will continue the conversation asynchronously. Um, thank you so much thank for your you time well. and for, for your research and your work. Uh, it's you know really fantastic to see such great efficacy numbers coming out uh, with you know that are well researched and, and uh, you know have good data behind them. So really looking forward to um, seeing more of that and, and helping everybody, all of the other um, jurisdictions working on exposure notification get get their efficacy proofs out there as well. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And, and please do reach out to me via Slack or directly because, um, yeah, we at the NHS are really keen to collaborate with everybody everywhere as much as possible. So um, please do reach out. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye.